All right, so this chapter focuses on manipulation of genes such that we can introduce, insert genes into cells, into organisms, and um, do so with the idea that there's some beneficial end product that we want to either produce and use in, in medicine, or we want to increase the yield for crops to make those, those corn plants more insect resistant. Um, it's basically manipulation of the DNA. And the last bullet there kind of gets at an important part of this whole discussion, and that is it is not without its controversy from both a religious, moral, ethical point of view. And I'm not here to, to get into that conversation, although it, it, you know, it, it certainly is interesting to do, but we could spend an entire course on, on that. Um, I don't know if a lot of you are even aware of the fact that most of the high fructose corn syrup that appears in soft drinks and in many products that you buy at Wegmans or Tops or Reeds or wherever you go is, has come from genetically modified corn. Did you know that? Yeah, I did. I think some people are unaware of, of that whole industry. It's, it's you know, amazing how much we've manipulated our cash crops to, to some extent. And I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to say it's good or bad, it's just the reality. Um, I am sure that scientists are feverish, feverishly working on developing a vaccine for COVID-19 and, and using this sort of technology if, if they can. So, and, and I cannot speak to the, the specifics of how these restric restriction endonuclease enzymes work, but in essence, these are enzymes that scientists use to snip or cut out DNA segments. And when we, when we think DNA segments, we should think genes. What is basically a gene? A segment of DNA that does what? Carries material. Say again. Carries genetic material. A gene is a segment of DNA that we can think of as is is being the instruction booklet for what? But we just spent some time talking about transcription and translation of genes in chapter nine. Including certain proteins. Exactly. So that that particular gene has that genetic information that allows the cell to construct a particular protein. So when we talk about the gene for eye color, blue or brown. Well, that, that blue or brown pigment that you have in the iris of your eye is, is a protein. And you inherited from your mom and dad each a gene, which when expressed in you, as you developed embryologically, resulted in the formation of either blue or, or brown pigment. We'll just say that. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's, but that's the gist of it. All right. So scientists are able to take a molecular scissors, we call them restriction endonuclease enzymes, that are able to snip segments of DNA at particular places. And then that particular snippet of DNA is going to be inserted into another cell. That's, that's the gist of what this slide is trying to get at. It's much more complicated than that, but I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of it. But just understand that when we talk about genetic manipulation, the scientists know how to snip out the desired gene 
from the genome of whatever the organism is that they want to pull it from. Okay. Now, once we have excised the desired gene using those restriction endonuclease enzymes in the laboratory, and we've isolated that gene, then it typically, as it says in step number two, is inserted into what's called a vector. Now, you got to be a little careful because in biology, sometimes we use the term vector in different ways. If I'm talking about malaria, what's the vector of malaria? I mean, there's some similarity, I guess, to this. It's a fly. Uh, it's a mosquito. Oh, yeah. yeah but so, but sometimes flies are vectors for other diseases too. You're right. So it's it's the vehicle by which the plasmo the plasmodium or the trypanosoma or whatever it is is transferred right to the to the person that gets bitten by the mosquito or what have you. So in this particular exist our example, we're talking about a cell. Um, well, I shouldn't say a cell. It's, we're talking about a, a, uh, an instrument which is going to be provided the gene, and I've got here, obviously brackets here, a plasmid or a virus can act as a vector. Now, what's a plasmid? Um, the pieces of DNA material. Yeah. Is it part of the chromosome? No. No, it's extra chromosomal and it's circular. We talked about the F factor and R factor plasmids in the previous chapter, remember, in conjugation. Okay, so we are inserting the desired gene, say, into a plasmid of a bacterial cell, or we can insert the gene into a virus, and then what's the virus going to probably do to it? What could it do to it? Replicate it? Uh, well, the virus isn't going to do anything but what? Inf like infect, a, like find yeah. a host. Yeah, it's going to infect a host cell. And then that host cell might gain that gene. Because we saw how it could be incorporated into the, into the chromosome sometimes, right? Yeah. So think of the vector as a taxi at Uber that is transmitting the desired gene and then ultimately that desired gene is going to be placed into the DNA of what's referred to as a cloning host cell and as I've indicated at the bottom here typically those cloned host cells are either bacteria or sometimes we use yeast and the reason that we like to use these two cloned host cells is because we can grow these guys easily in great quantities in bats you know you go to the EBC, and they've got the big copper vats that they make the beer in, right? Well, literally, they have huge, huge vats, bigger than that even, in these pharmaceutical companies that they grow these bacteria and these yeast cells that have been uh, genetically modified because they now have this new gene in them. That bacterium or that yeast cell can in turn then produce a product of some sort. And where did the instruction booklet come from to make that desired product? Well, it's here, right? It's, the, it's that gene that was introduced that had the instruction booklet, that was the instruction booklet that made that yeast or that bacterium produce a given, a given chemical that is then harvested by the pharmaceutical, part of pharmaceutical company and then refined and um, purified and it becomes maybe a drug of some sort. Okay, so here is a cell. Uh, okay, get, get out of there. Um, that's the source of our gene. We use restriction endonuclease genes or uh, enzymes rather, to snip out the desired gene, shown in blue. It's being inserted into a plasmid. The plasmid introduced in turn into a cloned uh, or cloning host cell that we grow in bats in the 
pharmaceutical comp company. And then as we said a moment ago, if that cell has the instruction booklet, i.e. blue gene, to produce a particular end product, like a hormone or a vaccine or some chemical, then, the, then that's refined and utilized and sold by the company. Now, in, prior to this technology, if you wanted to, to, to develop insulin, you had to use animals to get sources of, of insulin. It's very time consuming and expensive. You can do this in a, in, with, with little cells in a big vat. It's a hell of a lot quicker and it's a lot cheaper. And is there any difference between this insulin chemical and the insulin that came from the cow or the pig? No, same chemistry. So you see the, the economic upshot of this. I mean, it, it all boils down to moolah. <laughs> you know, it's all money, but it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. We're, we're helping diabetes patients and we're helping people who suffer from hepatitis B or what have you, you know? And then this other part of the slide is talking about how if that cell, um, was incorporated into a plant, this looks to be like a pea plant or soybean of some sort, the introduction of that gene into the host organism, the plant in this case, might allow that plant to be resistant to a number of different insect pests. pests. Um, it might have a higher nutritional value as a result of having that gene. Um, we're gonna talk more about this a little bit later. But this gets at the agricultural benefits of biotechnology, basically. And then this segment of the slide is talking about medicinal gene therapy uses. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a couple of minutes. But this is showing a virus that is infecting a cell that was taken from a leukemia patient, let's say. That, that virus is carrying the gene of interest that maybe can can help cure that child because he's unable to synthesize a particular enzyme, let's say, or something like that, and is getting incorporated into the genome of the host cell. And then we can reinfuse that cell back into the patient, and he can then generate the protein that he couldn't without having been provided it. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a first grade explanation, but you get the idea, I hope, okay? So this is just sort of a generic general slide that introduces kind of the overall application, but it's pretty cool. So these next few slides just get into a little more detail as to how plasmids or bacteriophages are used. And this builds upon chapter nine. So you gotta go back and gotta think about what is transformation, what is transduction, um, the utilization, right, of bacteriophages to introduce DNA from one, one cell to another. Um, in order to be a good cloning host cell, which we said were bacteria or typically yeast cells, they need to be able to be grown quickly, fairly cheaply in large quantities. Um, maintain those genes from generation to generation as the cells replicate, they're gonna, they're gonna copy that, that gene, right, that, they, that was introduced. So all of the progeny are gonna have that gene. Um, so this just gets at some of the, the various features that pharmaceutical biotechnologists like to see when they choose a particular cell to introduce the um, gene into and, and then grow those cells in, in, in big quantities. E. coli is probably the most famous cell used, cloning bacterial cell used in, in research. Here are some examples of different protein products that we may, we've made as a result of this genetic manipulation. And I've just kind of arrowed a couple that um, I thought were kind of interesting. Uh, you don't need to memorize this entire table, but I think it's worth paying a few, take a few minutes and paying attention to those arrowed uh, protein products. Uh, we mentioned insulin a few moments ago. EPO, uh, you might remember this from A&P, erythropoietin. 
Um, there's been some controversy about athletes using artificial EPO to boost their RBC numbers so they can perform more, efficient, more effectively than the neighbor who didn't get the artificial injection of the EPO. Have you heard about this? No, you talked about it not too long ago. Okay, right, in class. Um, TPA, this is a, a chemical a drug that is critically critical to employ to the patient shortly after he or she's had a heart attack. I mean, we're talking hours. If you, if you go beyond a certain time frame, increased risk of a bad outcome. You, you guys are into nursing, you know what I'm talking about, I hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, critical to get that in the, in the patient if they've had a heart attack, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is not without its controversy as well, utilization of uh, bovine somatotropin or bovine growth hormone to increase milk yield. Um, you know, dairy farmers give this to cows to, to boost milk production. There's a lot of controversy about that, but uh, that's the reality. We, we genetically make this stuff now. I thought this last one was quite interesting. Spider silk. Yeah. Some of the, some of the stuff they use, the, the Kevlar and bulletproof vests are, are made as a result of biotechnology. It's kind of neat. It is. Okay, this is talking a little bit more about genetically modified organisms and it's describing a particular historic uh, case of a bacterium here, Pseudomonas. You've, I think we've worked with Pseudomonas before in, in, in lab. We've never used this particular species of Pseudomonas, but back in the 19, um, early 1980s, they genetically modified a form of Pseudomonas. They introduced a, a gene into the, uh, the bacterium that was found to reduce ice crystal formation. And the idea was if we could utilize this product called frost ban on crops, we might be able to extend the growing season. So, you know, the first frost that kills your tomato plants in your garden, that's the end of the tomatoes. Well, if we could grow a lot of Pseudomonas syringae that's been genetically modified such that when those bacteria um, fall on the plant, they somehow protect it from being frozen, you know, maybe that's, that's the difference between, between having a good grape crop and not having a good grape crop. And, and not to get off topic, but you all know that in Chautauqua County, it's one of the biggest grape producing parts of the state, as opposed to Cattaraugus County. Why is that? Is it because they're closer to the lake? And what does that mean? I don't know. Well, well sure, they're closer to the lake. Yeah, that's true. But we're closer to the lake than, than Allegheny County is. <laughs> true. They're close enough to the lake that what doesn't happen? Oh, the plants don't they freeze. They don't freeze as early. No, because they'd be kept warmer because of the warmer water. Exactly. The first frost that we have in our area could be as, as early as late to mid-September. But if you go to Dunkirk or Fredonia or Silver Creek, they might not have their first frost until the first of November. That's an extra month of growing, you know? so as I said, this could potentially be a benefit. Well, as you can see from the slide, it turns out that there was a quite a bit of controversy behind the product and they never marketed it. It never, it never did get, get put on the market, but it was, it's one of the first cases of the utilization of this technology. Um, this slide just ironically talks about how we do use Pseudomonas syringae, not as a, uh, not, not the modified form that would reduce the formation of ice crystals, but rather we use the, the wild type form 
to help promote ice crystal formation. And they're using these in, in snow guns at Holly Valley and Holly Mont. And they, they literally add it to the snow guns and it allows them to make snow at higher temperatures. Like instead of having it at 32 or lower, they can make snow at 40 degrees. And why is that good? Snow business for all the skiing. You can get started, like get, get your base laid well before it gets cold enough to, to rely on mother nature. Yeah. Again, what does it boil down to? Mula. Right? Yeah. Okay, this talks a little bit about the introduction of a gene from a bacterial species. You all are familiar with Bacillus. Here. Oops, sorry. Um, well, it turns out that scientists were able to, to discover in Bacillus thuringiensis a, a gene that was acting as an insecticide gene. It, it, it countered the, the effects of, of uh, insects. So they introduced it, and don't tell me how they discovered that, I don't know, but they introduced it, they, they uh, modified, genetically modified, another strain of Pseudomonas fluorescens, <coughs> different species, but same genus. And then they released that bacterium to plants and the roots of the plants took that up somehow and therefore acquired that insecticide gene and therefore were more resistant to insecticide issues and the crop yields increased. So this is just an example of how, again, man genetic manipulation can result in increased crop yield. Um, this bullet at the bottom talks a little bit about how the EPA is really the governmental agency that is supposed to be monitoring a lot of this uh, industrial use, or, or uh, in this case, farm use. Um, but, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be political here, but I'm just going to tell you that since the current administration has been in power, there has been a significant lax in the monitoring of some of this, which I think is not a good thing. I'm not saying it's not taking place, but, but uh, it's, it seems like the environmental concern is not the focus of the current administration as much as it is the economic benefit or yield. We've been able to, to utilize um, these genetically modified organisms to our benefit in other ways too, including cleaning up oil spills. This is from, gosh, 30 years ago now, when uh, the Exxon Valdez oil refiner, uh, refining tanker crashed aboard a reef near um, Prince William Sound in Alaska, and it just killed tons and tons of mammals and seabirds. Uh, and the company b tried to use genetically modified bacteria that they sprayed onto the rocks that would help to digest the petroleum. And it was somewhat successful, but um, did not do a, a complete job, of course. It assisted a little bit in helping to break down the petroleum. And then uh, a few years prior to that time in Chernobyl, you've all maybe heard of the meltdown of the nuclear reactor there. And um, this is just not so much genetically modified plants, I guess, as much as it is the fact that some plants like sunflowers tend to take up the radioactive isotopes. Uh, and then instead of having it you know, in the water there or in the soil, then you can take these plants and probably burn them and then put the radioactive isotope up into the atmosphere. <laughs> you can't get rid of it, but you're just managing it a little bit. So it's possible, I think, that, that they've been able to manipulate the genetics of these plants so that they're more efficient in taking up, in this case, toxins from the environment. Um, I'll let you read that over. This is another uh, table that talks a little bit about how certain genetically modified plants have been developed and some of the benefits um, as a result of that technology. 
Um, I kind of encased this one here because I thought it was quite interesting. Instead of getting a shot, how would you like to eat a banana? I mean, there are certain vaccines that you'll be able to get down the road from eating certain plants as opposed to having to go to the doctor and get an injection maybe. I think that's kind of interesting. Um, So there's a whole host of plants that have been genetically modified with the idea of improving their nutritional value, their increased resistance to fungal infections or the effects of insects. Um, pretty interesting. This kind of gets at what we were talking about earlier, and that is if you look at these grain crops, soybeans, well, cotton's not a grain crop, I guess, but we'll call them crash crops. Soybeans, cotton, corn. And this only goes to 2014, so I'm sure it's probably up here now. A large percent of the acres planted of these crops are genetically modified seeds. I mean, you have to go back to the 1980s and prior to find non-GMO planted seeds. And the increase has been substantial just in, just in a you know, 20 year span. It's, just, it's, just, it's astonishing, really, I think. Um, again, can you tell the difference between a genetically modified kava corn and a conventional kava corn? No, they are the same. They look the same. They taste the same. Um, but look at the benefits. Less pesticide needs to be sprayed on the field. We're producing a higher yield, feeding more people. Farmer's income has increased as a result of less overhead. So, you know, lots of benefits. And then this is talking a little bit about not genetically modified plants, but obviously animals here, transgenic animals. Um, this gets into how genes are inserted into the DNA or how the DNA, I should say, is inserted into embryos. And again, I cannot speak to the technology. But the idea here is that we are introducing either into the embryo or the fertilized egg desired genes. We can do that. We can do that artificially with this electrified injection pipette. Uh, we can do that using viruses to infect fertilized eggs. Again, the virus is, in, is introducing the DNA that contains the desired gene. And then we let the animal transcribe and translate those introduced genes. And what's the end result? Well, the end result are mice whose eyes glow when, sh when shined with a black light. That's what you're looking at here. This is crazy, but just it goes to show what we can do. So three mice, the wild type is in the middle. These two, of course, are the genetically modified ones. And these are not glowing eyes or glowing ears or, or tails. This has been sh shown with a, a black light. You know what, what black lights are, right? Yeah, okay. And that particular ability to, to fluoresce in, in that wavelength of light is due to the presence of a particular protein. And so the, the source of that, that protein came from a gene that came from a jellyfish that ordinarily would glow under a black light. But we're introducing this into the embryo of the, of the uh, mouse. And when it grows up, that's the end result. I mean, is there any practical value to that other than to say you can do it? Probably not, but 
you can do it. It's kind of interesting. So to talk a little bit more about, you know, beneficial uh, outcomes to these manipulations is starting to get at how we can and have started to manipulate, for example, sheep, sheep and goats so that they produce in their semen or in their milk particular proteins that we can then utilize in some way. I'll give you some examples in just a minute. Actually, there's one right here. They mentioned here this alpha-1 antitrypsin to help address a certain type of emphysema. It's, it's produced by sheep. Now, this is kind of weird thinking about the semen. Not exactly sure how they get that out of the animal, but it is what it is. Um, So-called farming technology. Not FA, but PH, pharmaceutical farming, right? Here's a, a better list of some of the pharmaceuticals that have been produced, in this case, from pigs, from sheep, from rabbits, from cows, from goats. Here's that alpha antitrypsin I mentioned a moment ago. Um, interleukin. Actually, you, you know, our bodies make interleukins, but we can have rabbits make it for us. Helps in the fight against cancer. Um, here's TPA. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Goats can be modified such that they will produce in their milk or their sperm TPA, which can be then uh, filtered and um, you know chemically modified and so on and so forth. You get the idea. And here we're talking about using other animals to say increase the amount of uh, meat on the bone. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're raising most of our salmon that you get buy at the store. You, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not buying ocean salmon probably. You're probably buying farm fed salmon, which were genetically engineered. Now, do they taste any different than the salmon up in Alaska? Probably not. But you're paying uh, a lot less for the farm raised than you are the wild caught. So again, I think it gives you a pretty good overview of some of the interesting byproducts that we can we can utilize from plant, from animals that have been genetically modified. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. We got through quite a bit of that chapter, um, and we can kind of finish that up maybe on Tuesday. Um, I will tell you that the next chapter, which is 11, well, let me just stop for a minute and say, are there questions? Is there only one slide left for this chapter that you didn't go over? Um, could be. I haven't, I haven't looked. Yeah, I mean, we can finish it up if you want to just get it finished. I think there, I think there was just one left. Yeah, I guess there, right, there is only one left. I didn't realize there was just one left. Well, then let's finish that up. We'll be done with the chapter 10 then. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if you think back to that one slide that I showed you earlier, this one. We have basically just spent a large chunk of today talking about the lower part of this slide, right? So this very last slide of the, of the PowerPoint just gets at how this technology has been and can be and will be in the future helpful to you and I potentially. So if you have an individual, let's say, 
that's suffering from having inherited a faulty gene from his or her parents. Um, I'll, just, I'll just take an example off the top of my head. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if they're actually working on this or not. I wouldn't be surprised if they are, but has anybody ever heard of Tay-Sachs disease? No. No, okay. Tay-Sachs disease is due to having inherited um, or not inherited a particular gene from one of the two parents. And as a result of this genetic issue, the individual is unable to um, synthesize a particular protein. And the result is that in a child with Tay-Sachs, the brain doesn't doesn't function properly, and usually by the time they're three or four, they die. And there's really not a heck of a lot we can do about it at this point. Interestingly enough, it's most common with people of, of Mediterranean Jewish descent. And so like many of these um, genetic disorders, it often follows ethnic lines, not always, but sometimes. Or say sickle cell disease, much more common in African Americans than it is in Caucasians. Okay. You all heard of sickle cell disease, right? Or sickle cell anemia used to be called. Yeah. So if theoretically we knew that an individual, a baby, a fetus even, okay, we can do this testing on a fetus and determine it has, it's, it's, it's got a, a, a genetic issue. If we could snip out the desired gene okay, the normal quote unquote gene, and then put it into a virus, okay, so here's our vector, right, envelope virus, and then let's take, let's take some cells out of the, out of the, the child, in this case, showing, showing here, and let's let the virus with the desired gene infect the cells. Presumably, that gene may very well then be introduced into the genome of the individual's DNA. And then let those cells divide. We're looking here to create a bone marrow stem cell. So that stem cell is going to divide again and again and again. That's the joy of using stem cells. They can, they can divide almost indefinitely. And the progeny that are produced are going to carry that gene. And this is, of course, indicating the fact that we have this genetically modified set of cells that we can retransfuse or transfect back into the patient and look to see whether that gene will then become transcribed and then translated into the desired and the protein that the child couldn't make beforehand. I mean, that in a nutshell is what they're talking about here. So, this notion of ex vivo therapy is, you know, the utilization of viruses as vectors in this sort of process. And I think it's kind of ironic and interesting that we're taking a process that, you know, this notion of how, how a virus works and we're using it to our benefit, aren't we? Yeah. Um, this other type of therapy, the in vivo therapy, I don't know a whole heck of a lot about it other than the fact that we're not utilizing viruses. We're utilizing the introduction of the, the naked DNA, or it could, I guess, be, it says here a vector, so it could be a virus, I guess, for that matter, um, directly into the patient. Um, let's pretend, and again, I'm just, this is hypothetical. We have a patient with Parkinson's disease, okay? Parkinsonian patients, as you may know, tremble, right? It's a lack of dopamine in the brain. They don't produce enough L-dopa. So what if, theoretically, we could take and introduce genetically modified nerve cells, inject them into the brain of the Alzheimer's or the uh, Parkinsonian patient, or maybe even Alzheimer's down the road, who knows? And that could potentially provide enough L-DOPA, whereby the person goes from this situation to this situation. Now, I'll tell you back in the 90s, there was work being done on using fetal tissue that they were injecting into the brains of patients, and it, and it actually had a, a positive outcome. 
you never you've never heard of this because back in the 90s the utilization of fetal tissue in that way was was pretty much outlawed by the bush administration for, for ethical moral religious reasons you know utilization of of fetal tissue was thought to perhaps encourage the you know the whole um, the whole process of uh, abortion. So this may you know, be able to get around that utilization of, of you know fetal tissue, and we can use now biotechnology to help cure those sorts of diseases. And again, I cannot speak to whether indeed they are working on Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, but it would not surprise me if certainly that has not been thought of or is, is there not research being done on it as we speak. I think you get the idea, I hope. And so in your book, there is a section there on, uh, on 317, 318 that talk a little bit about this. And I'll make sure you, you look that over. Um, we're not going to get into genetic analysis or genome analysis, section 10.4. It's not on the PowerPoint, so don't worry about that. That's the very last section of chapter 10.